Hey everyone, Rootin' Tootin' here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for a review of this new Beyonce album, Cowboy Carter. I'm ready to who down at the hanky tank. Oh, of course you also got a hat. Yahi! Don't you mean yee-haw? Yoo-ho! Okay, here we have a brand new record from veteran vocalist, songwriter, multi-genre phenom, the queen bee herself, Miss Carter, Beyonce, Knowles. This is the Renaissance Woman's second installment in an ongoing trilogy series that kicked off in 2022 with her ode to dance and house music, Renaissance, which was one of the best records of that year, and I think uh, since then has grown to really become my favorite Beyonce album due to its incredible vocal performances, its bold production choices, how well Beyonce executed the concept of it all. And her ambitions are clearly growing even bigger on this new LP here, as not only are a lot of the lyrical themes and messages on this album uh, getting deeper and more personal, but Beyonce is also heading boldly into a genre many don't consider to be in her wheelhouse, Country. Now, of course, hardcore fans will instantly recall classic moments like Daddy Lessons uh, from her landmark album Lemonade, where yes, she dabbled in a bit of country, but still, this is not a style of music she really made her name in. So, of course, an album in this direction is going to be a tough swallow for some fans and many detractors, because there are a lot of Beyonce listeners that aren't necessarily country listeners. There are a lot of country listeners that are going to look at Beyonce like she She's an outsider for reasons that are kind of valid, but also do very much in part to feelings of entitlement, fear of the unknown, and of course, bigotry. And while I might be kind of preaching to the choir here, of course Beyonce is very much allowed to make a friggin' country album if she wants to. And there's a range of arguments that could be made. The first being that she's from Texas of all places. Texas. Texas. She would also be far from the first modern artist who didn't start in country and yet is kind of jumping onto the bandwagon as the genre is uh, seeing kind of a commercial gold rush at the moment. Post Malone being a very recent example. A dude who's been more or less accepted instantly by large swaths of the country fandom, despite him breaking into the music industry as White Iverson, if you guys remember. Beyond this, we could dig into deeper conversations that would take hours to unravel like uh, America's troubled history of copying, pasting, and whitewashing various strains of black music, or the fact that the country industry for years has lost complete touch with the soul of the genre for well over a decade now as it has repeatedly pumped out all of this bro country commercial sludge. And thankfully you have a new generation of commercially successful artists who are finally bringing it back to basics again, but that's another video. But yeah, there are numerous YouTube videos on the internet going over the various ways in which country has also stolen so many production aesthetics and musical ideas uh, from hip hop music as of late, from R&B music. Uh, shout out to Grady Smith's video on Snap Beats. Beyonce doesn't get into the weeds of the discourse on this record per se, but she does come ready with pretty preemptive chess moves to quiet down the stupid arguments. As this record is loaded with tastefully rustic instrumentation, you have the aforementioned Post Malone on the album featured too. The great Dolly Parton is on the album, one time specifically as a means of introducing Beyonce's cover of Jolene. Willie Nelson is on the LP in these cute little vocal bit skits where he's like a radio host. Beyonce also pays homage to country's black contributors, uh, bringing on Grand old Opry performer Linda Martell, and then things come full circle as she invites on a newer face who is making waves in the genre these days, Shibuzi, for a couple of tracks. So Beyonce has seemingly crossed all of her T's and dotted all of her I's for this album, uh, but it kind of makes for better marketing than it does art, because while I understand Beyonce wanting to stand up for her right to make this record, the extent to which she does it uh, kind of comes off as a bit insecure and makes the vibe of the record feel more unnatural and like more of a put on than it really needs to be. Which, mind you, is the polar opposite vibe of Renaissance. Nearly everything that record did felt 
natural, felt so confident, even the most outlandish moments on it. And conversely on Cowboy Carter, just the abundance of uh, justification-based interludes and crossovers, it, it does kind of throw things off, especially the flow, and also serves as a bit of a distraction from what really should be the selling point of the album, the songs, the core songs of the record. Because for music fans, for real, actual music fans here, those good songs would be all Beyonce would truly and honestly need for a justified country crossover, which I think is displayed in the fact that uh, people were already kind of loving the teaser singles to this record without all the extra rigmarole the, the track list on here brings. 16 Carriages, Texas Hold'em, the latter of which went number one on the country charts, and as a result, this record is probably on track to uh, win some Grammys in the country category next year. But yeah, the sad truth is there's no number of Dolly Parton endorsements that uh, would make a Beyonce hater or a naysayer at this point get on board with this record. So you might as well just sing your songs with the talent and passion that you know you have and just uh, let the tracks speak for themselves. There's maybe my biggest criticism of the record out of the way that uh, it's a little bloated, kind of defensive at points, but when you dig past that to the meaty songs on this record, the central songs on this record, Cowboy Carter becomes a great addition to uh, this trilogy. And a lot of its best moments aren't even country per se, more of a celebration of classic mid-century popular American music. Take the opening track, American Requiem, for example, which is like this grand psych gospel odyssey intro with gorgeous vocal harmonies spread across these insane and lush layers of synthesizers, sitar, and tambourine. Some booming drums pop into the mix later. The whole track is like Beyonce's own personal Woodstock. And lyrically, we kind of get the central stance of the record at this point as well. Uh, she is facing the wind. Uh, she is not pretending anymore. And we also have allusions to familial struggles that she will dig deeper into later on the album, uh, specifically when it comes to burdens and behaviors inherited uh, from her father. And to fast forward really quickly, can I say that I love the fact that uh, a lot of the music and the themes on this track are reprised on the closing song of the album Amen. But yeah, past this track, it is really smooth sailing into a very solid first leg of the album. We get a very simple, tasteful, and beautiful cover of The Beatles' Blackbird, a Paul McCartney track uh, that's one of my personal faves. The song contains what sounds like uh, an original sample of the guitar parts from that Beatles recording. There are some added strings into the mix. It sounds like Beyonce is is laying down some great vocal harmony is a killer lead too. It's not the most ambitious revision of this track or song on the album, uh, but in the overall flow of the record, it just kind of seems like a very pretty, serene, interlude type moment that sets us up for the bigger tracks to come, like 16 Carriages, which I loved as a single. I love even more in the context of the record. The track is this powerful country rock fusion moment with crashing guitars and cymbals, a steady pace beat, lots of swells of organ and pedal steel, monstrous bass too. With all of this soundtracking Beyonce, penning lyrics about all the blood, sweat, and tears that she's put into music and performing over the years, as well as her family. And uh, the track is really poetic, especially when it comes to the imagery around the chorus of the 16 carriages riding off into the distance with her fears, with her anxieties. And if you didn't think things could get more teary-eyed, we have the following protector, which is an amazing acoustic ballad where Beyonce is singing about motherhood, uh, wanting to protect and take care of her children, but simultaneously uh, be someone who's also going to let them go when it comes time to let them just kind of be their own people. And honestly, if anything makes this album country, it's moments like this. It's not the crossovers. It's not the cosigns. It's these beautiful stripped back moments where Beyonce is bearing her soul and making herself more relatable than she's ever been. You would truly need to be soulless to stare into the way Beyonce is exposing herself on this track and just poo-poo it and just look at it as, as garbage or a put-on or a facade because it's really anything but. Uh, from here we have a few more interludes and then of course it's Texas Hold'em, which I also loved as a single, but if you're yet to hear it, do not go into this track taking 
taking it or yourself too seriously. It's just kind of pure, silly, wholesome fun with a lot of tongue-in-cheek cliches thrown into the mix for a country appeal. Uh, if you were really going to try to sell this album cycle on a whole country thing, I maybe wouldn't have gone with a track that comes across maybe so metropolitan as far as how methodical its production is or, you know, uh, mentions of, hey, we're just going to go vibe at the dive bar and, and park your Lexus. Jesus Christ. But still, the vocal harmonies on this thing do go off. Uh, the chorus is quite snappy. Uh, the banjo and guitar licks are great, too. The groove is on point as well. If we're judging this merely by the standards of modern day commercial country pop, this track is a winner. And surprisingly, Beyonce explores different eras of this very thing too, like with the track Bodyguard, which production wise is kind of like a 90s pop rock crossover radio tune, uh, Cheryl Crow, Shania Twain, that kind of vibe. There are some groovy bass, some sticky background vocals. Woo with a lot of focused lyrics about Beyonce's uh, need to protect a lover, someone who she cares for, with hilarious bars about uh, protecting this person in the mosh pit. <laughs> Beyonce throwing elbows during the breakdown. Then following this, we have uh, the Jolene cover on the record, which has been a bit polarizing. And like, calm down, for one, because unless you've been living under a goddamn rock, uh, covering this track is not sacrilege. There's been a million versions of it already. There will be a million more after this. So how is Beyonce crossing a line here, especially given uh, the cover is so quality? She's gone the extra mile to lay some great vocals on it, and I love that she put in the effort to switch the lyrics and the narrative of the song around to kind of update it and make it about her and make it work within the grander scheme of of the narratives around uh, her relationship, her marriage, cheating that she delved into on previous records. If you've been paying attention, you get the references. And it works. It works as an addition to the Beyonce narrative. It works as a standalone moment. And I think things get even more incredible from here on the song Daughter, which again, this is like really the singer-songwriter core of the LP. Another amazing, lyrically focused part of the record where Beyonce is going more into those dad times. Again, this track is also one of the most theatrical on the record as well, uh, with the narrative and lyrics reading as almost Shakespearean at points. Some of the vocal passages read as kind of operatic. Then things get surprisingly uh, campy on the track Spaghetti, which implies we're going to be heading into a different direction with uh, the Linda Martell intro. Uh, Beyonce is not going to be simply confined by this country thing, so of course she from here goes into... <laughs> A kind of a banger, a trap trunk knocker, where Beyonce is rapping and making reference to her holster. It's absolutely pure hype, but uh, unfortunately from here we go into a kind of spotty midpoint on the record. There's Alligator Tears, which is not my favorite tune here, but I do like the narrative of the track a lot, with Beyonce describing uh, kind of bending over backwards and giving into the whims of somebody who is uh, always whining, crying, manipulating the song Just For Fun, I think, might be one of the biggest snoozes on the LP. Uh, lyrically, this one just didn't really hit like other tracks on this record do. Uh, the instrumental palette is a lot blander than other cuts on here. But melodically, I don't think it's a standout either. I mean, it passes, it's listenable, but it's not really a moment that rocked me, either instrumentally or emotionally. But Two Most Wanted with Miley. This one's a barn burner. Great killer duet whose chorus I'm going to be singing for months. Not singing well, mind you, but singing. I'll be your shotgun rider. <laughs> but yes, very simply, it's a love song. It's a song of devotion with some great writing, some standout lyrics, and just some killer, killer vocal chemistry, especially when those Beyonce and Miley vocals are doubling up on the chorus. The trades on the verses are nice too. They just play into each other really well, and that's all there is to it. Uh, following this, though, we have Levi's Jeans featuring Posty. Yes, Post Malone, who again, I see why his inclusion would be necessary in a way on the record. I also enjoy the 
the fact that Beyonce really got him to sing on this album uh, without a bunch of bullshit vocal manipulations uh, that are so heavy-handed or a ton of freaking reverb. But the songwriting I'm not really crazy about. I, I, I just kind of feel like this track, the more I hear it, the more it just feels like product placement. <laughs> this could literally just be the sound bed to a Levi's commercial. Uh, not a bad Levi's commercial, but still. There's not as much soul going into this track as there are others, I'll say that. Going further into the last leg, unfortunately, I feel like the general bloat of this record is contributed to by shorter moments that don't really go much of anywhere and just don't stand tall next to other more key highlights. Uh, I'm talking about tracks like uh, Desert Eagle as well as Flamenco. But I do sort of see Beyonce's vision for the final leg of the record because it feels like she is trying to create a bit of a bridge between the country direction she's moving into on this record and what she previously did on Renaissance. As the song Yaya is this crazy trap soul vintage rock hybrid uh, that's very much Tina Turner. It kicks off with this Nancy Sinatra sample as well. Uh, there's some background vocal bits that call back to uh, the very girl group era that Beyonce is known to uh, be a fan of and, uh, you know, paid homage to in her own right previously, like in the role she played in the film Dream Girls. It's a simultaneous update of numerous music styles that are all kind of being clashed together in a way, uh, not too unlike like stuff we've heard in the past from artists like Janelle Monet on records such as Arc Android, but still, it's a thrill of a song on the album. Then River Dance is a dance number with a lot of plucky bluegrass style instrumentation. And once again, you're getting a lot of those acoustic bits chopped and looped like you're hearing uh, uh, some endless dance grooves or a house track, something like that, like we would have heard on Renaissance. So again, it's like house or dance music music build, but aesthetically, we're, we're getting rootsy. And again, it works. It's a very creative and functional meld. And I love the way this track transitions into Two Hands to Heaven, too, which gets uh, way more low-key, introspective. Like I said, while the flow of this record might be a little weird and spotty and not super consistent given all the interludes, all the breaks, uh, when Beyonce and her team nail the transitions on these tracks, they really nail them. And the song Tyrant gives us the real kind of best final bop on the record. Steamy track where we're getting kind of <laughs> more driving hip-hop fusion dance instrumentation, um, some fiddle as well, and Beyonce is like really just intersexual bag, <laughs> just going crazy, uh, absolutely crazy, going on about how she's, you know, riding it like a tyrant. It's just kind of one of those moments where you have to fan yourself off. There were many of those on Renaissance for sure. But after this, uh, we get Sweet Honey Buckin', which I, I think is I think is my least favorite track here. I, I do not like this one at all. It's actually a nightmare. And again, it feels like another allusion to uh, Renaissance with all these kind of crazy transitions and ideas and musical styles crashing into each other. But the whole thing just has no direction no focus, the transitions are a mess. Uh, on top of it, Beyonce doesn't really seem to know what to do over much of it, as a lot of her spoken word bits and refrains are landing pretty flat. Bucking, bucking, bucking like a mechanical bull. <laughs> look at that horse, look at that horse, look at that horse. And even when Beyonce is delivering some good, skilled, quality melodic vocal lines, like in the first leg of this track, they're kind of smothered by some really annoying, incessant vocal samples in the production. But at least from here we do go into a very solid finish with Amen that I mentioned earlier. And that's the record that closes things out and it's a very lengthy listen, lengthier than I think it really needed to be, but it's still, as I said earlier, a great album and a very good addition to this trilogy. On the macro level, with the flow, I think the record could have been better, could have been a stronger, more cohesive vision. But when it comes to the core songs of the album, Cowboy Carter is stellar. I don't prefer prefer it to Renaissance per se, but it's mostly due to reasons that are more surface level or are more just kind of window dressing. Because if you kind of stripped away a lot of the unnecessary bits, I do think there is like another Renaissance in the rough here. There just was not as much finesse, unfortunately, when it came to the execution, but still, great album. Loved the majority of the songs on the record. You could say it's Beyonce's most personal album, too, since Lemonade. And even if I'm not loving it as much as Renaissance, I mean, it's, it's really right there, and at this point, I'm still 
uh, very much holding out hope and I'm anticipating a total blowout on the third installment of this trilogy. And all of that is why I'm feeling a decent eight on this album. Transition, have you given this album a listen? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? You're the best, you're the best. What should I review next? Hit the like if you like, please subscribe and please don't cry. Hit the bell as well. Over here next to my head is another video you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, Beyonce, Cowboy Carter, for, for forever.